Welcome back to Repair University. Now we're going to continue our estimating series. We left you off last time with kind of a basic general overview of estimating damage from your walkthrough to your photos to getting all your information. This time we're going to pick it back up with specific damages, front, side, and rear. And we're going to start with the number one estimate that you're riding in your facilities or if you're an adjuster, the front end impact. Now I've already gotten my vehicle information in and my auto vent systems decoded and Larry, Thanks for joining me again. Thanks for having me back again, Kristen. Now, we know from the statistics that uh, from everywhere in the software companies that report that the most common estimated damage is the front end impact, which means that's got to be the most common supplemented damage that we have on an estimate is front end. Let's go over just in general today what an estimator appraiser needs to think about when they're going to write a front end damage car. Everyone looks at the front of the car, and my whole thing has always been start at the opposite end. I mean, if the cars hit directly in the front like these two vehicles have here, I would start on the opposite end, maybe open the trunk lid, you know, check the position of the rear tires. Uh, also, I would uh, predicate that on what happened in the collision event. You know, was the car sitting still? Was it moving? Was it stop and go traffic? Did airbags deploy or not? Even though the airbags are part of the uh, process of looking at the vehicle, we really need to know what happened in the, you know, what happened in the collision event what were the circumstances or the description of the accident so that we do know what we need to look for. A car getting into a frontal accident at 40 miles an hour is completely different than a car sitting still and someone backs into it versus somebody in stop and go traffic like we have in New York uh, where we have constant traffic jams and people aren't paying attention sometimes and that stop and go they get into a, a low speed collision event versus a high speed collision event. Now on these two, we've got them in. We've got one here in the Mercedes, fresh off the tow truck, just brought it in. In fact, we just untied the hood from the tie down <laughs> ropes. We could get it yes. open. And we've got the Volkswagen behind me that's in a, a stage of first type of blueprinting. There's been some tear down done to it. What are some of the advantages of going ahead and doing just some minor tear down to one that's had a front end impact? Well, it goes back to my original EMI 54 theory that I came up with years ago. Once again, shops always say I don't have the time, but you don't have the time to do it the right way once. We find the time to do it the wrong way seven or eight times. When the vehicle first comes in, you obviously want to get it washed off, get any road, grime, dirt, especially now in New York. We just finished with you know a really bad month and a half of snowstorms and salt all over the cars. Get the car washed, take a look at it, take some notes as a, as a damage assessor. Uh, start writing your estimate or start coming up with a preliminary parts issue and repair theory. Send it into the triage, blueprint, x-ray, whatever, whatever catchy term you want to use and get the car taken apart. Now the car's taken apart, you come out with your tablet and you go ahead and you start going over the car with the teardown tech and you find all the other damages that you couldn't see because the car was together. And you should measure the car at that point. Um, if it fails uh, under some of the mechanical stuff we'll do for measuring and then electronically measure it and make sure that you have everything down pat, you should limit the supplements or have no supplements except maybe for a dealer reset or very few part price differences in some cases. And that's the proper uh, quicker way of doing it. It might sound longer, but actually the long way actually is sometimes the very short way of doing it. Right, now we have a couple of things that are kind of common on front ends that we see in supplements all the time. Um, Let's kind of go over just a quick list of some of the things that an adjuster or an estimator might forget. You know, obviously we can tell from this Mercedes, of course, sports mangled pretty bad and I'm going to replace that. But what are some things that the guide to estimating is going to tell me that we're just typically leaving off on the estimate? Well, any front end collision event, years ago it, it, it was really different. You had the Germans with a lot of the aluminum stuff in the front. You had the Japanese that had uh, plastic core supports. Now you have a big mix, even with the American cars, where you have aluminum reinforcements, sometimes aluminum uh, uh, crush caps or ex rail extensions for the bumper plastic core supports or a mix of plastic and steel core supports, so now stuff breaks easier. The reason behind that is, is they want to have less collision energy go up to the upper rails and to the lower rails, so by having these core supports that break away or, 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 or fracture faster or deform faster, it's to prevent that collision energy from getting onto those rails and causing more damage. But what's attached to the core support? You have your 
obviously your radiator and your air conditioner condenser, but now we have multiple different, uh, um, depending on the vehicle, multiple different coolers, oil coolers, trans coolers, uh, sometimes power steering coolers are all attached to the front of the vehicle. And these aren't even the aftermarket ones we used to see years ago for for performance, we have them now for cooling. So you have those, you have the lines that run for each one of these that can that, that are pushed through small openings in the core support that can get crushed very easily. You have Parktronics with wiring harnesses that are attached or fixed to the bumper uh, fascias. You also have the wire harness that goes on the core support that obviously we know is wrapped around and in and over and through the core support that can also be crushed or damaged. And many times you can't fix these harnesses. You have to buy a complete harness uh, uh, back to uh, the junction box area. Behind that then we have, because they're jamming engines inside these smaller engine bays, uh, you have now all the other components have to be pushed off to areas. So now you have your ABS control module that's attached to the ABS unit uh, somewhere in the front area. You have your washer bottle, and then next to the washer bottle, you sometimes have a reservoir. So you have all these fluids and stuff like that that's all jammed in this area, and some of this stuff you can't see that's damaged until you get stuff apart. Now, some of these fluids are kind of proprietary to the make and model and can be quite expensive if you have to get them in the supplement procedure. Is that right? You have a wide range of fluids that are in vehicles now, especially transmission fluids. Basically, oil you can buy anywhere. Uh, Mercedes-Benz uses exclusively the mobile one, like a lot of companies do, the full synthetic model. You can buy oil anywhere. You can go even into 7-Elevens and buy oil. They got a little department there. But power steering fluid on a lot of the vehicles is specific to the vehicle. Uh, transmission fluid is especially uh, something you really got to watch out for. Uh, um, I have an Infiniti. I have to put on a J-Type from Nissan. Nissan also offers because they have a CVT uh, for their, their hybrids or even a, a, a CVT in some of their models, like the Murano, which takes a different type of oil. If I were to mix the J into the CVT oil, I could actually cause a, 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 a lot of gunk to build up or get the uh, material very thick or, or viscous, and it would actually blow the transmission within a short period of time. Uh, uh, different manufacturers require different fluids for that. Antifreezes. So it's almost like you've got to look at these fluids outside of engine oil that it's basically like DNA. It's like uh, uh, blood, you know, within a body. If I'm an O positive and you're A negative, I can't give you blood, you know, so there's only certain compatibility with bloods and stuff like that. So these oils, even though they might be made by the same manufacturer, you know, that's giving, let's like, say castor oil, is making the transmission fluid for both the CVT and the J-type, well, it's two different formulas. So you have to really keep those separate. And a lot of the shops now are having, in their parts department, they actually have a secured, air, well, a special area that they have all these fluids listed by manufacturer so that it's just easier to grab off the shelf. Right. Now I'm going through my database here and I'm looking in you know, on this Mercedes. I got a lot of electronics that are available with this model. Parking sensors, radar cruise control, etc. So when it comes to front end collisions, what electronics besides airbags should the estimator be concerned about? It's basically everything. I think part of the, the repair process now besides doing your damage analysis of the car, is getting into the practice of taking at least a code reader. Now there's some very cheap code readers that'll read a bunch of stuff. There are some very expensive models out there uh, from OTC, Snap-on, and uh, Mac, Maco, a bunch of companies that you can plug into the data link connector we used to call it the OBD2, now it's called the data link connector, and find out codes in the car. Now remember, just because there's not a light on the dashboard doesn't mean there's not either history codes or a current code. Not every uh, uh, mechanical failure or component failure will set a code that will set a light. A diagnostic trouble code or a, uh, a diagnostic trouble code will not set a malfunction indicator lamp. So if I don't have a mill on the dashboard, I cannot assume, oh, everything's good in the system. You know, if there's a light on, you can really assume that there's something wrong. But if there's not a, a light on, that doesn't mean the system's perfectly fine. There could still be something in the code. So as a damage assessor, you should plug in, get some sort of printout or take pictures of each code that's written out. I personally like the ones that can work with a laptop. I can get a printout or some sort of, you know, tangible product that I can show an insurance adjuster or appraiser and say, hey, look, I got all these codes. Now, you got to remember, if I take this tablet and I drop it on the floor, I'm probably breaking the glass. But would it work? It may not. Well, now I'm taking a vehicle and I'm moving this thing along, I'm taking a 5,000 to 7,000 pound vehicle, I'm moving along 40, 50 miles an hour, and I'm spinning it around. How well would this little computer do if I spun it around at 50, 60 miles an hour and smashed it into something? It probably wouldn't work, and the car does work. So we're not going to set a couple of codes. 
you sometimes get an update with this, and you got to shut it down and restart it. We don't do that with cars, do we? You know, you're not driving along on the highway, and all of a sudden we got to shut the car. So the anticipation of there's got to be something computer wrong in the car should be checked. And a lot of times people say, well, the car runs fine, it starts fine. It may not be. And one time, uh, sometimes one problem will cause other problems down the road. So a month down the road, I might have every light on the dashboard. Oh, that's not accident related. Mm, it might be. We don't know because no one checked it at the beginning. All right, that's so true. So we know that in the repair facility, you're going to run into front end impacts more than anything else that's out there. And the old adage of if I can't see it, I can't write it really has to go away. Right now as an appraiser, your job is to find that damage almost with the same veracity that a forensic investigator finds it. So get in there, be sure to get through your teardown process, look at everything individually, follow the guide to estimating, look up your OEM information, and don't forget about all those extras, connectors, fluids, hoses, and those parking sensors and, and sometimes those airbag sensors that are up there so you can get a good idea of the damage. Stay tuned on the next episodes of Repair University. We'll be back with more information to make your shop better.